Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of integrated photonic circuit lecture and in this particular lecture we are going to look at photodetectors. So, photodetectors as the name suggests detects photons. So, the fundamental process is converting a photon to charge carriers and this is something that you must have already uh, very familiar with. So, let us look at how this fundamental process happens and how we could do this in a semiconductor and integrate this in a, in a circuit fashion. So, let us look at that. The simple process of photo detection um, is governed by the internal photoelectric effect right. So, the photo detector is primarily trying to do is to put a create a charge pairs here right when there is an input field and then you want to take out the charges out. So, the first thing is absorption of photon and next process is transport of free electrons. So, this is essentially what we are trying to do. So, when the photon is absorbed, absorbed photon should result in electron hole generation. So, this is the essential necessary condition in order to uh, create a photo detection using a uh, no, quantum detector. So, there are other forms of photo detection as well. So, there is thermal as well, but in this uh, uh, particular course we are primarily interested in light detection in semiconductors. In, in semiconductors the, the fundamental process here is to generate charge carriers and these charge carriers should be able to um, be transported right to create a, a current flow and this absorption is an important uh, characteristics right. So, that that depends on the material system and if this is our energy that we have and this is absorption coefficient let us say. Um, so, different material got their own band gap right it is band gap driven system. So, what you would see is something like this right, where you have very uh, low or no absorption below the band gap. So, this is your band gap that you have and then once you are going into the band then there is a complete um, you know very high absorption right. So, when there is low absorption outside the band once you again to the band you have very high absorption and this uh, band gap um, uh, depends on the material as I mentioned for silicon um, the direct band gap is 4.10 and for germanium it is 0.81 and there is indirect band gap for this as well that is 1.14 and 0.67. So, we normally um, um, uh, look at this uh, direct um, uh, indirect band gap only when we discuss silicon or germanium, but if you look at the, uh, the band diagram the E k diagram um, you also have a, uh, a direct band transition as well which is much much higher right. So, that is why the indirect band gap wins here. So, just for, uh, for you to uh, remember. So, you will have something like this right. So, for silicon or even for germanium in this case. So, the direct band gap here is 4.1, but the indirect band gap here is 1.1 ok. So, this this these two uh, band gaps are there uh, for both this material ok. So, 
just keep that in mind why there is a direct band gap for sil silicon or germanium it is there but then it is larger than your indirect uh, band gap and that is the reason why the indirect uh, gap dominates because it is lower energy any transition happens within that and for 3 5 materials it is all direct only right. So, 1.43 for gallium arsenide for indium phosphide it is 1.35 and so on. So, that is giving the band edge here right. So, this is all at 300 Kelvin room temperature. So, what is the implication of having high absorption? So, we are interested in this region right. So, you want very high absorption right. Uh, so, just uh, for example, if you have an absorption coefficient of 10 to the power of 3 per centimeter, um, let us say um, the power required to reach 1 over E right. So, that is 1 by alpha is equal to 1 by 3 centimeters. So, that is about 10 micrometers. So, the absorption length, the absorption length right when alpha is 10 to the power 3 uh, per centimeter would result in 10 micrometer long device. So, that means in a 10 micrometer long device the power decays to 1 over E ok. So, this is our power and this is as a function of length ok. So, what is this length requirement and, uh, and that is what this particular uh, uh, length is all about. So, let us say when it is 10 to the power 4 per centimeter. So, then your absorption length will be 100 nanometers and if alpha is 10 to the power of 6 per centimeter this would result in 10 nanometer right. So, this is optical power absorption. So, 1 over E optical power absorption length ok. So, as you can see when um, the uh, the absorption increases right the the length that the photon should travel also tremendously reduces at the same order okay so this is very important because that is the first function that we want we want to absorb the photons inside the medium right so you want to have very high absorption make sure to so select a suitable material that has high absorption ok. So, the absorption as I mentioned could be in would be between two bands right one is direct and another one is indirect band gap absorption, but normally indirect band gap as a lower energy. So, the, the, the transitions are primarily in that lower energy. So, um, one interesting um, uh, fact that should be um, noted here is uh, the photo detectors itself. So, we have photo detectors uh, from different materials right. Uh, for example, uh, the photo detectors that you have uh, in your uh, cell phone camera right and that cell phone camera has silicon uh, as the material in it right. So, most of the charge coupled device the CCD cameras they use silicon as, uh, as the material, but silicon is an indirect band gap material right. Um, the question here is whether we can use indirect band gap material as photo detectors because in our all earlier discussion for the light emission we only wanted direct band gap material all right. So, now we are saying that we, we whether we can exploit indirect band gap characteristics. The reason for that is this two important characteristics like absorption should be there and even more importantly we should generate carriers that we can transport. So, the carrier generation is important ok. So, let us look at uh, you know silicon as an example uh, which is an indirect uh, band gap material to see whether we can use it uh, as a photo detector. So, um, silicon and ger uh, uh, germanium uh, got both direct and indirect band gaps right. So, that is what we, we saw. So, the indirect band gap uh, you know requires the assistance of phonons right. So, that 
your um, uh, your momentum uh, is is con momentum and energy are conserved right um, this is required for emission process but for um, uh, detection process we don't need right let us look at the reason there so this is e and this is sorry this is k and this is e so now we have two bands let's say so now when I put in a photon inside the system. So, you will have electrons sitting here. We have electrons sitting here. So, if this um, energy of this uh, uh, photon is greater than the band gap, right? So, that we have in this case indirect band gap that we have, then you could actually take this absorption here right by absorbing this and you will generate uh, the carrier here but then it could thermalize right so this this thermalization could happen right the thermalization would happen and this is a, a, a and this thermalization will make the you know a charge come into the value point here okay so the indirect band gap material you could use this you know for um, uh, light detection right but then it is going to be slightly inefficient compared to direct band gap material because of this transition and this transition is assisted phonon process right so you have um, leakage or thermal uh, uh, thermalization right where you are giving energy into the phonon. So, that means that energy is essentially lost into the material itself you are not using it for charge transport. However, your charge is now in the conduction band. So, that is what you are um, uh, interested in okay. um, you are you, you want to create that uh, charge that could be uh, conducted through the uh, through the material system right. So, let us this is the process through which you can make an indirect band gap material detect a photon ok. So, for silicon um, we have two bands right. So, um, we have a band that is between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 micrometer and then we have a cutoff um, and uh, a direct band gap that is happening at 4 um, ev that is at 0 0.3 micrometer okay so this 0 0.8 to uh, 9 is our indirect and this is our direct uh, detection so this a uh, particular detection right 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 that we have is uh, primarily uh, coming from the the band absorption that we have similarly uh, for germanium we have um, the, the indirect absorption uh, that is happening with a threshold of 1.85 micron right and then we have direct absorption that is happening at 1.3 micrometer ok. So, this is uh, the two bands that um, your germanium uh, will, will start uh, acting as a, as a you know photo detector. So, uh, silicon is a very popular material we are using it for multiple application right uh, popular application including cameras and so on uh, is, is dictated by this uh, uh, wavelength range right. So, how do we choose the material? So, how do we choose the right material for this? It is rather um, is uh, straightforward. So, you want to detect a photon and make sure uh, instead of this, make sure that your energy band right is slightly lesser than the photon energy that you need. So, that means you have a transition like this and then you could have a transition like this. So, this is our lower level right and this will be your higher level right. So, by using the right uh, photon energy bands we should be able to generate this. So, that means your photon low level energy should be greater than or equal to E g. So, this is where it starts to 
start uh, con, uh, creating or absorbing the photons. Okay. Um, so, once you have this, this, uh, this higher the energy level, the better the absorption. So, all you want is higher absorption. Right. And what happens if you if if you are if it is too high, right? So there the problem is uh, thermalization. When you are going to very high energy level, it is going to thermalize. So thermalization could result in you know a uh, lot of heat, right? And this will also create you know thermally generated carriers as well, and which is also dark current in this case okay so um, the that thermalization uh, is is energy loss but at the same time your energy gap right should also be you know greater than uh, your your kbt limit and this is one of the reasons you know um, why detecting long wavelength photons are difficult. So, when you are using quantum detectors right like the, uh, what we are discussing now, um, when you when you have a very small energy right so the longer wavelength energies let us say 0.1 eV um, let us say um, then your band gap should be also 0.1 eV right or even below that, but that strongly depends on your kBT because you do not want your temperature to create thermal thermally generated carriers. If the thermally generated carriers are high, then you will have dark current, right? So you don't want that to happen. So narrow band gap material would result in larger. dark current. What is dark current? There is a current flow without illumination, right? What is dark current? Current without illumination. So, when you have a semiconductor and because of the heat, um, you will start conducting. So, the charges are already starting to flow and that is what dark current is all about. So, you will not do not want that dark current and uh, by choosing material with larger band gap um, should help you in achieving this. Okay. So, you can also use um, uh, you know 3, 5 semiconductors for this. right? So, this is all for silicon let us say. So, you can also silicon and germanium you can also use 3, 5 compound semiconductors. Um, so, here you can use uh, a combination of, uh, of material here. So, you can have indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide phosphide and so on, indium gallium arsenide in this case. Right. So, um, the, the whole idea of using this is um, is the ability to change the the band uh, the band gap okay um, so you can change the or what you call engineer the band gap through composition change so, by changing the composition um, of material that you have here, we should be able to create different band gaps and that means you can detect uh, photons of different um, energies. Right? So, let us look at um, uh, a very simple you know PN diode that can be used as a photo detector. So, this is the band diagram of uh, a very simple p n junction right so when you have this particular region is called our let me draw it properly
this is called depletion region. of certain width w and then you will have some uh, diffusion regions as well. So, this region that are very close to is called diffusion region. So, this is whole diffusion and this is electron diffusion right and L e and then L h right. And this whole the distance between these two is called the active region which is nothing but W plus L e plus L h ok. So, why do we have this diffusion region because of the field that you have. So, when you create a p n junction you have a, 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 a build in potential here right. So, you will have this uh, uh, field that has an influence on the region uh, neighbor by region where you could um, get the charges into the field. Uh, after this region where you have homogeneous region and here again where you you can generate carriers, but they will not have any influence on the field that you have all right. So, uh, let us understand how uh, uh, the the, uh, the absorption process happens right. So, in the um, depletion region you will you can generate carriers right when you have a photon impinge right and this will be drifted. So, this drift happens because of the build in potential that you have right. Similarly, you could have photon that is in this uh, diffusion region that could uh, create what you call the diffusion current here. So, there is a diffusion process here. Similarly, we could have uh, an electron diffused through the system. Okay, so, this is diffusion. And here again we have diffusion that happens, but then you could also generate carriers outside this region right. So, you could you could generate this outside this region, but the problem here is um, there is no uh, field um, uh, with which the carriers could get drifted or diffused. So, here the resultant will be recombination right um, before reaching the junction. So, it cannot reach the junction where it could uh, we could separate the carrier. So, they, they are unable to reach the, uh, the junction here. Similarly, you know the, the electrons that are generated here they are unable to reach the, the junction here. So, this is how the process in the various uh, absorption regions happens in a p n junction uh, a diode ok. So, we need to understand that light can be absorbed in any region right. So, in whole of the semiconductor we can um, uh, induce charges, but then the important thing is again I will go back to our fundamental idea transport of this free electrons are important. How do we transport that? This transport depends on where the, the drift and diffusion fields are right. So, unless you can um, uh, the carriers are in the diffusion or in the drift region you would not be able to collect those carriers. So, let us look at the, the currents that these guys are going to generate. So, in the depletion region so you create a drift current because of the 
the the voltage uh, the built in potential that you have or the reverse potential the reverse potential that you have right so in this case you could have drift because of the built in potential but we can also do a reverse uh, biasing this right so the p could be connected to n and the n will be connected to a uh, anode in order to make this reverse bias so you will have a, a, a drift current happening here okay and then you could have diffusion in the diffusion region you will have diffusion current right so in homogeneous region you will not have any current forms there is no current generated because you do not have any influence of the field right from the depletion region so you are unable to diffuse there might be some diffusion happening here right the charges could diffuse a little bit left and right here right but then they would not be able to reach it because the lifetime of these carriers are short enough that before they reach the diffusion region and then or you know the, the, the depletion region they will be you know recombined right. So, the recombination lifetime is much shorter than this ok. So, when you are eliminating this with a, uh, uh, with, 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 a, with a light source right. So, how the junction currents are going to be generated between this different region. So, let us look at that right. Um, so, the photo current in an illuminated junction So, let us have a cross section area A right that is the area A and we have a certain energy H nu right. So, photon energy H nu all right which is obviously greater than E g. So, now the photo generation rate the photo generation ray it nothing but electron hole pair per centimeter cube per second right that is g right. So, that is our g and this gives rise to a photon current right. So, there is a, a holes that are generated and there are electrons that generated. So, the number of holes is given by the area times the hole times the generation rate. So, L h is the whole generation here look at this right and then L e is the length of the diffusion region there. So, now number of electrons or A L e times g right p side and the n side and now the total carriers right the carrier generated within the um, carriers in the depletion region is given by A w times z right. So, w is the width here you see. So, A w g right. So, now what is the junction current? So, the total current here. So, so junction current from n to p right is given by i p which is nothing but e times a times l h plus l e plus w times g. 
So, this is our total current that is going through and let us look at uh, a very simple uh, uh, you know diode uh, configuration that gives us um, how this you know current is going to change right. So, the, the basic the diode current equation right and that is something we all know e to the power e v u over k v t minus 1 right and um, we also know how it looks. So, this is what we call the dark current right when there is a reverse voltage right there is there should not be any current flowing through, but then there will be a leakage current right um, which which is due to the saturation current. So, so I, I know it is nothing, but saturation current or in other words thermally generated free carriers right. So, due to thermally uh, generated carriers free carriers all right. So, which results in dark current right. So, now when you eliminate it right. So, upon elimination so this equation is going to change a bit right. So, you are going to add a reverse current here there is an additional current that is going through this and this I p we have already seen what this nature of this I p is going to be right. And, and you take a, a simple p n diode and the current will go through this right. And So, this is our I naught. So, where G is 0, G is equal to G uh, let us say instead of 1 G 1, G 2 is our new generation and this is actually our I p right. So, the current that we are generating right and uh, there is interesting points here as you all know you know. what we call the potential across. So, the, the short circuit current and the open circuit voltage is something that we all know from a, our simple diode understanding. So, the short circuit current when V is equal to 0 is I p and open circuit voltage that is I equals to 0 which is V p right. So, now your open circuit voltage is K B T over E times log of I p minus I naught plus 1 ok. So, we can find what is the potential drop across uh, this diode right uh, based on the illumination or the based on the current that we have. All right. So, um, another important thing to, to notice here right uh, compared to the other uh, uh, basic diode electrical understanding is what happens to your current and voltage with respect to intensity. So, when you have an intensity of certain watts here the current as a linear trend. So, your current will actually um, linearly increase with the intensity. However, your voltage will saturate in volts. So, voltage will saturate while your current will linearly increase right. So, your I p 
is proportional to the generation rate here. Okay. Um, however, your voltage is proportional to your current that is generated here. Okay. So, the limit to this one right that V p it saturates to that right. So, this is limited by the open circuit voltage is limited by by the contact potential right. So, equilibrium contact potential. So, it is not internal to this. So, you the contact potential uh, gives you the limit um, to which you can have your open circuit uh, voltage here. Right. So, you can operate this uh, uh, the diode uh, you know in two different regimes right. One is photo conductive regime, the other one is photovoltaic regime right. When you have an illumination um, you generate a current change right that is photo conduction based on the illumination the current changes or in uh, in photovoltaic you generate a potential drop across. So, there is a change in the potential that you have. So, it is basically whether you are in third quadrant or whether you are in fourth quadrant. Let us say the operating regime So, you could take a, a p n junction and connect a load resistor and do this and when there is a incoming photon right you will you will generate a current like this and this this is where you want to operate. this is called photo conductive mode ok. So, the uh, the circuit you know the, the, the positive power is uh, or the power is directly delivered to the external circuit through this uh, load here. So, this is something that you can do once you connect it through a a reverse bias. So, you can see here this is a reverse potential right. So, you, you have to connect it through a reverse potential you should be able to operate it in this right. So, there is an external reverse bias right which results in reverse current ok. So, we primarily operate the photo detectors in this photo conductive reg uh, regime right. So, photo conductive uh, operation working in the third, third mode. So, the other mode is photovoltaic right where you do not connect any power source right into this and when there is a, a photon imp impinging. So, what you get is this. and you are operating through this right. So, it, it works with where the principle is called photo voltaic where the power is delivered to the load by the device ok. This is the solar cell thing. So, there is an internal bias and a reverse current ok. So, this is how um, your um, uh, you know two uh, different regimes of uh, diode operation we could use uh, one or the other, uh, but for um, uh, for integrated circuits we and also de detectors the high speed detectors we use um, uh, the photo conductive mode where we deliver the positive power to the external load that you have here ok. So, um, let us look at uh, how this reverse bias is going to help us in, in this in achieving this. So, reverse biased p n diode. So, we can take a, a very simple diode here 
this P type and N type and connect this to negative positive when you do this. And when you connect this, it creates a certain width here, right? So you have depletion width plus diffusion width, all right? And the electric field will start this and then high in the depletion region and then it dies down. So we have depletion region and then we have diffusion diffusion region all right and the light is getting absorbed right in this whole region so we don't have to worry too much so the light is getting absorbed in this 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 whole region you know if you are eliminating it from top so you can see here the light is traveling through p type material through uh, our junction and into n type okay so that is the reason why you make p type um, uh, thinner than the n type. So, you have larger n type compared to the p type. So, p type is p type material, p type is thinner than the n type. All right. So, the idea here is to make this absorption happen in this depletion region so that you can efficiently collect the charges from this all right because that is where your depletion region is present all right so um, you want this depletion region uh, to be very large right um, so that you can efficiently absorb light so instead of having um, a simple pn diode we can increase this whole depletion region and the absorption region by going to a PIN configuration. So, we can take configuration where we have P type, where we have N type and then we have intrinsic in between and here again it is reverse biased. Right? So, in this case uh, the field would look very large you have a very large field distribution and then it will end before the n type starts. So, this is the, the depletion region which is equal to absorption region. Okay, so, now we have very large absorption region and that is overlapping with the, um, the depletion region. So, you have effective collection of charges that you are absorbing. Another important thing to notice here is the n type material that you have right on the lower side you wanted this, this to be highly doped right so that you reduce your resistance right. So, all the absorb absorption takes place in the depletion region and the intrinsic region um, can be an uh, this can be an n type material for all practical purpose and then makes a low resistance contact to this n plus right so this n material uh, the uh, the intrinsic material right could be slightly you know n doped right so the intrinsic should be or n minus minus let's say right so one could have such a configuration where you could efficiently collect the charges through the system okay um, so, by doing this you can um, efficiently collect the charges these are different uh, configurations that you have um, and the other important thing is the problem with the capacitance once you make these diodes PAN the capacitance starts to crop in right. So, the internal capacitance C i is given by epsilon a over width right. So, as you can see here when you make this really large really wide right your capacitance um, sh will have an effect uh, on this. So, if uh, d is the thickness of what you have right let us say if
is equal to W then is essentially the different thicknesses that you have in the medium all right. Um, you can just use it as D uh, because you can look at both the depletion and also uh, you have the diffusion uh, capacitance there. So, it is a combination of diffusion and deple de uh, depletion capacitance could be taken here right. So, the capacitance is uh, independent of the bias voltage right uh, in this particular case and it should remain constant you know throughout the operation. So, that is something that uh, uh, that is um, that is PIN offers right. So, in um, in PIN um, uh, the important thing is um, capacitance right uh, C i is independent of the voltage that you have in this case bias V bias right. Uh, but, but in uh, in in P n junction right your junction capacitance here is a function of voltage right. But in this case your your junction is pretty large and whatever change that you may have because of the DC is negligible. So, you can neglect that ok and your uh, the responsivity right of um, or the current that you could generate out of this system right uh, is the next important parameter it depends on the, the the current right. So, the current generated is the the quantum efficiency the charges that you get in and your flux that you have. So, here eta is your quantum efficiency ok and responsivity R is nothing but the current to the power that you apply. So, this is power optical and that is the current that you get. So, this is given by eta E s h nu or in other words eta lambda divided by 1.24 amp per watt ok. So, the, the, the responsivity for LEDs on the other hand is watt per amps right. So, how much watt of um, uh, power is generated for the current that you give in, but in this case it is how much of current is generated per um, watt of input uh, power ok. And now, the, the response of this um, you know diodes let right? us say the frequency response or bandwidth right. So, frequency response is another property um, that is determined by the, the capacitance and the junction capacitance we have and your load resistance right. So, the junction capacitance that we have the internal junction capacitance will play a role and also the load resistance that we connect here R L right. So, R L is load resistance and this is your junction capacitance and similarly we could calculate this with our quick thumb rule given by this ok. So, it depends on our uh, race time right. So, this is our race time uh, response. So, that is nothing but as a function of time we have a pulse racing from 10 percentage to 90 percentage what is that time required right and based on this we could uh, calculate uh, this is the current calculate what is the bandwidth that we have here ok. Um, so, based on this time difference right uh, the, the race time um, we could find how fast this uh, particular diode is, but this uh, the time that is uh, that is taken depends on two things right the race time depends on two different things one is drift and other one is diffusion. The drift time is what we call transit time. So, how much time it takes for the charges to drift and reach the electrode right 
and that uh, that is uh, uh, that strongly depends on your mobility right so drift velocity is given by e divided by m tau collision let's say right so mean time uh, between collision right so mean time between collision is this and E is the charge and M is the effective mass, effective mass of electron that you have. So, this could be written as simply mu E. So, mu is our mobility. So, this is the reason why if you want a a fast detector right which 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 where the charges could be collected fast find a material that has you know high carrier mobility so the frequency response depends on your mobility in this case so you can uh, get a, a, a material with um, uh, higher mobility that will result in you know a very low transit time that means the diffusion dif drift current can be much faster so, also this uh, transit time that uh, we are talking about right um, also depends on the size right um, your tau T r the transit time depends on you know how large your width is right. So, the tra transit time depends on the velocity and the distance it has to travel right. So, make sh uh, we cannot make uh, you know depletion width very large right. For example, um, you know if you have uh, depletion width w which is 1 micrometer right, um, then the transit time will be approximately you know. Um, for silicon at least transit time will be about 10 picosecond ok. So, you can have uh, a smaller uh, uh, you know depletion width in order to reduce this transit time right. So, next thing is the diffusion uh, uh, time right. So, so, the diffusion time that is tau diffusion depends on the minority charge carriers right. So, so d is nothing but minority carrier diffusion coefficient. Right. So, uh, based on on this that again d is your you know uh, uh, size right your diffusion uh, uh, distance here right. So, the d that we already saw earlier um, where is it yeah. So, w plus d here. So, d is the diffusion. So, based on um, uh, the diffusion um, width right uh, diffusion uh, layer width we should be able to um, calculate this particular diffusion time. So, it is important for high speed right that this diffusion mechanism should be completely eliminated right. Um, for high speed operation tau diff should be eliminated. So, we do not want this to be there. Um, so, whatever carriers out generated outside the the depletion region you do not want them to come in right. So, you do not you want to avoid the diffusion um, so that you can have only the drift uh, component which are much much faster ok. Uh, so, the diffusion components are much much longer in this case they are in in nanoseconds ok uh, in nanoseconds. So, you do not want this to, to affect your uh, speed of operation. So, you want to reduce this by controlling your um, diffusion uh, uh, 
lifetime here. Okay. So, uh, based on this uh, one could calculate what is the uh, total time required right, in order to get um, the maximum speed right, that is achie achievable using um, a, a particular diode configuration. Right. So, let us look at um, the transit time a, a limit uh, as well here um, when it comes to 3 dB uh, limit right. Um, the frequency of operation is given by the transit time limited right. So, this is our transit time limited frequency bandwidth. It only depends on the transit time and this is this can be given by this. Okay. So, uh, based on this one can you know work out how to compensate um, for uh, the capacitance that we have between uh, the PIN junction and PN junction configuration and we can um, uh, look at various um, you know integration strategies in order to get this. Um, in the later part we will look at how to integrate this into the into a guided wave system as a demonstrator and, and then see how uh, you can have a, a, a guided wave right and then integrate a photo detector on top or photo detectors on the side in order to detect or extract this photons into um, charge carriers. Uh, but in order to analyze those data we need to understand the basics of you know how fast it can operate, what are the limitations of those uh, speeds and also uh, we need to look at the, the responsivity. So, uh, how much uh, absorption length is required in order to achieve uh, certain responsivity and so on. So, with this we have you know covered how to understand a photo detector right uh, in a semiconductor and later in the course we will see uh, how we are exploiting this understanding uh, to demonstrate a photo detector that is integrated with an waveguide. Thank you very much for listening.